pray. Father, we just thank you for your word today and your presence and life. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to speak to us. And Lord, that your kingdom will come right now in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, uh, we, we've been talking about transformational thinking. Corey, I need you to pay attention and because uh, I need you to flip. I'm sorry, I'm putting it on you, but I see you talking, so I need you to flip that. Okay. A single dream is more powerful than a thousand realities. Let's go to the next one. And we're just going to rehearse some of the verses that I've been going over. Okay. I can just forget about this whole thing. I'll just, I'll just preach, okay? Okay. Um, so uh, one of the verses, though, was from uh, Romans 8 and then Romans 12, that God wants to transform our minds. And then uh, Timothy, we've gone over that one, that God hasn't given us a spirit of intimidation. And he wants us to have disciplined thinking. So, Lord, help us to have disciplined thinking. And so one of the tribes, though, and I, we've talked about depression. That was the tribe, the Jebusites over Jerusalem. But one of the tribes that was in the promised land uh, was basically the root meaning of it is pride. And uh, that's often one we don't think about, but it's probably the most powerful enemy that we could run up against, okay? Because... Uh, there's some qualities to pride that, for example, uh, pride comes before a fall, uh, before destruction. But one of the indicators of pride is to think that I don't have any issues. I don't have any problems. Okay? So pride is one of the biggest ones because why do I need to listen to this? Or why do I need to go to church? Or why do I need to... For example, I'm going to ask this question. How many have been reading their Bibles and spending time with God in the Word of God? Okay? How many have been praying? See, a, uh, an, an example of pride would be, I don't need my Bible, I don't need to pray, and I don't need to give. Why? Because I've got it all under control. I've got it all. It's all here. I've got it. Okay? So... I'm just trying to give you indicators that, you know, it's bigger than we think it is at times. So one of the biggest indicators of pride is thinking I don't have any issues. Okay? I don't have any issues. I don't need to deal with stuff. And so we don't humble ourselves. Um, it, if I were to put it in one word, it would be saying, I'm going to live my own life independent of God. Okay, very tempting in our part of the world, independent of God. So if I were to say what the opposite of pride is, it would be dependence or surrender. Okay, so I need to be dependent. I need to be surrendering to the Lord as often as I can. One of the, another indicator might be me comparing myself. Paul said, don't compare yourselves among yourselves. Sometimes we look at other people and we say, oh, you know, I wish I could do that, or I wish I could be that. And we don't accept ourselves in our own limitations and the qualities that God has given us. So Craig had said, you know, we are not equal. I, don't, I, I think some... I, Check. Thank you. Um, we're not equal in our responsibilities. And so uh, in the book of Acts, it says that God has chosen their habitations and their boundaries, even for nations themselves. And so true humility would be to say, I accept my responsibility, for example, for me as a man, not as a woman or a she man, but as a man. Okay. I got in trouble this week because I, well, I won't even say it. Uh, 
It's the first post that was taken off of Facebook that I put on there, ever taken off of Facebook. It was basically a picture, picture of a puppy dog, and it said Bruce Jenner's cat on it. But anyway. <laughs> I don't get why they took it off, because I didn't mean it in ne necessarily, because we love everyone, but what the world is saying to us now is it doesn't matter. We don't have to be confined. We can be whatever we want to be, and that's ultimate rebellion against God. It says everybody did what was right in their own eyes, and they're doing it right now in America. They're doing what is right in their own eyes. And the sad part is, and I'll share it in a few moments, the story from 1 Samuel, but nobody, hardly anybody, I shouldn't say nobody, but hardly anybody is standing up for truth and righteousness because we're all intimidated. And all that is because the enemy has flooded across our land. He has shrunken the church to a non-effective place in society today. And it's time for the sleeping giant, the sleeping whatever we want to call it, to arise and be the church to rise and get filled with the Holy Ghost, to arise and be an example to society of what true righteousness is. Listen to me. We don't help society by saying everything goes. The reason why we don't help them is because kids get confused, kids get taken down into hell, and people are dying without the Lord Jesus. And they're confused even about their identity anymore. And the enemy wants to mess with our identity. He wants to cause us to think we're something other than what we really are. You know what? I'm a child of skipping a needle of fever. I was born in Onalaska, Wisconsin. I have a place here. I was, I was raised in construction, so I have certain skills that I know that I identify with. I was in athletics, so I know I identify with those things. But most of all, I am a child of the living God, and I have an identity that belongs to me before God. And because of that, I need to live that out before the society. Okay? Listen, we're not helping people when we don't tell them what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, what's evil, what's, what's righteous. Like I said at the funeral the other day, good people don't go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Righteous people go to heaven. I said there's such a thing as a, 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 a sinning saint and there's such a thing as a, a good sinner. Yeah, a lot of times there's better sinners than there's saints because they're not living it. But once I'm a child of God, that's what counts. I am born again by the Spirit of God. Everything else, all the other identities, submit to that major identity be between me and God. We want to hold on to the earth. See, that's what the world does. Love not the wor world, neither the things that are in the world. For the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life does not come from the Father. Does not, everybody say that. Does not come from the Father, but is born of the world. And such were some of you. In other words, our lust is not here on this earth. Our lust is not to be building bigger barns and doing other great things that the world can say, good job, great, 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 great. Well, since you have re your reward right here. We need to change our minds to say, my ultimate destination is the kingdom of God. And I'm going to have rewards in eternity, not just right here. I'm going to seek God and Him first. And if He wants to bless me with other things, then praise God. But if I have to die a martyr's death, if I have to go before ISIS and get my head cut off, and praise God for that too, because I'm living for the Lord Jesus, and that's what truly counts. I tell you what. I assess my time on earth. It says redeem the time, right? I look at my time and let's say the average life, I'll, I'll just say it's 75, 80 years. I've, without giving away my age, which I will, I'm having my silver anniversary this year. Okay. Okay, so I have... 25 to 30 years to give glory to Jesus in this body, this shell, this thing that's going to die, this thing that's going to be dust in a little while. All this is going to pass away. But you know what? I've got 
a few good years to give glory to God, and I want to make every one of them count. Why? Because this, this stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't matter as much. Yes, we want to provide good things for our children. We want our kids to, you know, we're so proud when they accomplish certain things. But have we taught them? Have we taught them the, that the most important things are like the Word of God and prayer and having a relationship with Jesus? Have we taught them that there's more important things than putting a trophy up on the trophy case? That there's more important things than just getting a car that we need to tell people about Jesus. You know, when's the last time I saw a kid get excited that they led somebody to Jesus? See, that's, it's all pride. It's all about here. It's all about my own life. It's all about having life centered around you. But somebody that is truly humble doesn't center their life around themselves. They center their lives about, around God's plan. You know, and it's not hard to do because you just love God. Everybody say, I want to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength. Adam and Eve, Eve was tempted. She said, hath God really said? The first area of pride that we run against is that we need to doubt what God has truly said. And so what do we do? We push the borders. It's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. It's okay to step outside the boundaries that God has put for us. I and my pride say, it's okay. But God says, no. We all know what the boundaries are, but we push them. We step over them. We play with the lines. God doesn't want us. I, I like what one person said you know, what, where's the gray areas? It, it's not about living in the gray area. It's about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength so you're far away from the gray area. You're just loving Jesus. Loving Jesus. That's where revival comes in. See, the devil wanted to convince Eve that God was holding out on her. And that's the temptation we all have. You know what? If we would only try out sex because God's holding it back. Hath God really said we shouldn't have sex before marriage? Because, boy, it's so good. It's so nice. It's so great. Listen, it's pushing the boundaries that God has set and living our own way rather than God's way. That's pride. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have anything put around my life that can subjugate me to these boundaries. That's pride. We need to get rid of it. We need to transform our thinking. We need to say, I'm a humble servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus gave the parable, he said there was two men. One came to the temple and said, you know, I'm so glad I'm not like other people. I don't cheat, steal, I don't lie, I don't do all these things. You know, I give my tithes, I do all these things. And then another one came and he bowed before God and he beat his chest. He said, God... Be merciful to me, a sinner. I don't deserve your mercy. Jesus said, which one went away justified before God? And we all know the answer, the one that beat his chest and said, Lord, have mercy upon me. See, humility relies and is dependent upon God. That doesn't mean it's okay to sin during the week and we beat our chest every weekend. All of us might have sore chests after a while. Okay, that doesn't mean we just go and do what we want. True humility would say, God, now I need your help. I've beat my chest, but now I need your help to live for you. Okay, I'm broken. I can't do it myself. That's humility. I, I break my own ideas of how to live for God. I say, I take up your idea. I take up your strength. I want you to help me, God. Let me get a little into the identity though because Eve did not have that identity clear in her mind she was willing to go beyond the boundaries that God had set and she took of the apple Jesus when he was tempted I said the greatest temptation was not the power was not the pride was not the prestige that the devil offered Jesus he said if you are the son of God 
He kept on saying, if, if, if you are the son of God. He wanted him to doubt who he truly was. And that's why, you know, when Craig shares about this, that we're not equal, he, it wasn't about not being equal, it was about understand who you are. Understand your identity. Until you get that deep down in your heart, you will never be completely successful with God. Because you're always striving to be something else. You're always striving to do this. And you're always striving to be like so-and-so. Listen, God has a plan for you. God loves you. God loves you enough to give you direction too. If you would just seek him. If you just humble yourself. If you just bow before him. You know what? There are times where I had fasted and cried for years. God, if you just show me. I cried. Look, beat the ground. Lord, just show me. Just show me. It doesn't all come in one day sometimes. Sometimes it's a consistence, a persistence, a perseverance. It's sometimes it's saying, God, I need your help again and again and again. I wish I could say, you know, and some people have this idea. Well, you just go to Pastor Andy, he'll hear from God. You know, I don't think he always wants me to hear from God for you. I think that, for the most part, is your job. We've taught people to be lazy in the kingdom. That's a prideful thing. Let's just go to the person that can give us an answer. Let's go to the next prophetic word. Now, God does have prophetic words. I'm not against that, obviously, from last week. But he wants you to pursue him. He wants you, like Adam, to walk with him in the garden. He wants you, like Enoch, to walk with him for years and years and years so that you can hear from him for yourself. Don't just go run to the nearest guru. So Satan, he was the first one that fell because of his pride. He said, I will, I will ascend to the mountain of the Most High. I, I shall be like the Most High. Do you think that now the, the prince of deception, the, the king of this world, the god of this world, I should say, has maybe in his plan book to cause us to fall because of pride as well? Absolutely. And he does it mostly by us being independent. By us trying to do things on our own. And he wants, God wants us to be dependent on him. Oh, I've got so much to share. Let me just share an illustration here with you. Uh, Ronald Reagan, he was listening, uh, or he was giving a speech, and they, you know, they, they clapped just a little bit, and afterwards he sat down and uh, a guy got up and he was speaking in Spanish and everybody was clapping, yay, yay. And Ronald Reagan would, you know, he'd take and he'd clap too, yeah, yeah. He had no clue what he was saying. And one of his uh, associates said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. He's just repeating what you just said. Okay, so oh, the crowd was mostly Spanish. <laughs> So they weren't hearing Ronald Reagan the first time. They were hearing it the second time. Okay? And so he was just clapping over his own speech, you know? <laughs> How many times do we do that? Give ourselves the kudos. Well, here's the thing. If we want the Lord to be opposed to us, God opposes the proud. We would be independent of him. It's the thing that God cannot stand. We might as well just take a big target and tattoo it on our back and put a big bullseye on it and wait for the lightning to start striking and walk outside and say, Can you hit me now, Lord? <laughs> That's how much God hates pride. Okay, so a haughty spirit before destruction and a fall. In other words, if you're living a prideful, independent life, he has a way of bringing you down. 
And it's not that God wants to do it. It's he needs to deal with the attitude. And how many in here are children of God? Okay, well, I'm talking to you. If you're not and you didn't raise your hand, then I'll have a, a chance for you to become a child of God maybe later. Okay? But if you're a child of God and you're walking in pride, one of the things is, uh, everything went along with my message today. Peggy was talking about forgiveness. One of the things we cannot do if we're living a prideful life is forgive. Stick our nose up in the air. I can live without them. I can live independent from them. Okay? Another one is perfectionism. Pride, and, and I have a struggle with this one. I, I like to be a perfectionist. I spent four hours working on a message last night just trying to get the right words. My wife says the first ones were the best. Why are you spending all this time doing this? Because I like to have the right words. It's not this message, by the way. Uh, so... <laughs> But sometimes we want to be we want to be perfect in everything we do. You know, I think God has a little bit of grace in that whole situation. It's like that little boy that was playing piano. Uh, it was a professional pianist that was going to come up on stage, and he just got started plunking the piano, bang, 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 bang. <laughs> and his mom was horrified. He's up there, and then the the virtuoso comes out, and she's horrified even more, right in front of everybody. And then he comes and he starts playing a beautiful song in the midst of him plunking. I think it's that way with us and God. We just kind of plunk and do our best. And God's sitting there, I'm going to make something good out of this. I'm going to bless this. How many know going a little bit, little ways with God is a lot better going a long ways without God? In Proverbs it says, it's better to be with the poor or than those that are uh, basically, uh, uh, what do you call it, when they take uh, things from war, the plunder. It's better to enjoy, uh, be with the poor than enjoy the plunder with the rich. Okay? It's better not to be proud and be with the plunder than it is to be humble and be with the poor. Okay? Because God can't stand pride. Okay, so, uh, boy, let me share a story from 1 Samuel. And I'll do my best without turning there because there's a lot of good points. And uh, this is such a powerful story. It's when Samuel is being born and uh, Eli, who's the priest in Israel, he is uh, supposed to be guarding the, the temple there at Shiloh and the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. And then his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were living an ungodly lifestyle. They were like this. They were full of pride. They were living their own, in, in their own way, and they were doing things that they shouldn't be doing. They were even having sex near the temple. They were taking the women and uh, using them. And then they were taking the, it says the fat of the offering that was supposed to be given to God, and they were taking it for themselves. Okay? Well, Samuel comes to the temple. He's just a young boy. And God speaks to Samuel at a young age, I'm going to bring judgment to the house of Eli. Wow! As a young boy, would you be intimidated to share that with, with the guy that's watching over you right now? I mean, he has power over you, right? Not only that, he's a big dude, okay? Samuel obeys the word of the Lord. He gives it to him. Okay, so later on, uh, what they do is they get in trouble with the Philistines. It says 4,000 of the Israelites get killed. Well, Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the main leaders of the land, they decide, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take the Ark of the Covenant with us, and we're going to defeat the Philistines. Okay, so they were using it as a, a good luck charm. Okay? rather than having the right heart behind it. See, we can go to church our whole life, not have the right heart, and never get the right results. God wants the right heart first. Everybody say right heart. Right heart. Well, they weren't, they weren't in, in the right. They just wanted to use it so they could win the battle. Sometimes we use God to win our own battles, okay, rather than having the right heart. So what they did is they brought the Ark of the Covenant, brought it before the battle, 30,000 of the Israelites die. 
Not only that, Hophni and Phinehas are killed. Eli hears about it. It says he was sitting on a fence. He was a very large man. He falls off the back of the fence, breaks his neck, and he's dead. So everything that Samuel prophesied came to pass because of the pride of these men's hearts. It says that in the midst of this, that as they were doing their thing, that people despised the offering of the Lord. And I want to say this because uh, it's so powerful. The first thing that often goes when a person is living a prideful life is your giving back to God. I don't say that just because we need more money. God's taking care of the church. But listen, the first thing that will go is your wallet. The first thing that will go is you giving back to God your thanksgiving and your praise and your offerings. Why? Because I can do it on my own. God can bless me. I don't need to do, do this, right? God can bless me despite what God would have me to do. It's getting awfully quiet here. Do you want a preacher that tickles your ears? Or do you want a preacher that speaks the word of God? Okay. I want to hear it a little louder. So they were judged partially because they caused others to despise the giving back to God. Okay? God wants us to give. God wants us to be givers of heart. God wants to bless us. We understand all this. But he, uh, you know, if we tried this with our wives, it won't work too well. Honey, uh, uh, let's say my wife asked me, can I uh, have some money? I need gas for the car. No, you can push the car. Don't worry about it. Do you think that would go over very well in my household? No. I, I can guarantee you my wife wouldn't take one step to push that car. I know her well enough. Okay? But why do we do that with God? Why do we do that with God? We don't give anything back to him. I think it's partly financial. It's also spiritual. I understand all those things, but he, 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 the physical is part of the spiritual. You can't detach the two. It's an attitude of the heart. Not only that, it says that God judged them and they were committing sexual acts in, in, in the temple. And it says that God was ready to strike them dead. Okay, now that's not good preaching, Pastor. God loves everybody. He doesn't like the proud of heart. He doesn't like those that are living in rebellion. He doesn't like those that have made themselves a friend of the world, it says in James. Make themselves an enemy of God. Listen, you can have such a bad attitude that God wants you dead. Sorry to say. Okay, unless we say the Old Testament doesn't count anymore, but then we look at Ananias and Sapphira. Okay? Rebelled against God. Okay? There's certain things that destroy us. They don't help us. Yes, God loves us, but he wants us to walk in obedience too. Ah, it's getting awful quiet, Pastor. I'm just preaching from 1 Samuel chapter 3 to chapter 6, okay? I'm just telling you what happened, okay? So... These things come upon those that walk in their pride. Independence of God, independence of being able to offer to God, independence of, of uh, having any boundaries, living in lust. These things brought the judgment of God. What we sow, we shall reap, the Bible says. Yes, there's forgiveness in God, and God knows, but, you know, oftentimes we say, you know, God just wants to bless his children. We taught him the word of faith. Stand for faith. Believe that God's going to prosper you. But we haven't taught them to work their buns off so that God can prosper them. So being faithful on their job and being consistent with their children and being faithful in all these things. We haven't taught them those things. So, God's judgment comes upon Eli's family. 
God's judgment comes upon all of Israel. They lose the presence of God. It's taken to the Philistines for a while, and that's a bad place to be, have the presence of God in an ungodly atmosphere because all of them end up getting what the Bible calls hemorrhoids and stuff like this, cancers, different things, and they sacrifice to their gods, and they do all these things, and they were living a miserable lifestyle. So they send it back. They send the Ark of the Covenant back. We're not dealing with this stuff. How many know that the presence of God doesn't belong in the world? Okay, listen. We are the habitation of God. We are the church. God can have certain requirements upon us. I don't expect Bruce Jenner, uh, although he did, I read an article, he did quote, love Jesus apparently, but I don't expect the world to act like the church. They've never been born again. Okay? But the church should act like the church. The church should be holy. The church should be humble. The church should be pursuing the presence of God. How many say amen? amen. Okay, so uh, the Philistines, they can't act like God, but the children of God, they should be. The Israelites should be. But they were independent of God for so many years. The Ark of the Covenant rests in a place for 20 years. 20 years. They don't know how to deal with it. Samuel himself, he's probably a young man. Now he's probably 20 to 27 years old. Okay? Now he's a young preacher. And they're all wondering, how do we, how do we change the situation? How do we become above and not beneath? How do we overcome our enemies? And, and Samuel said there's basically four things you need to do. That's First Samuel, I believe, chapter 6. And I have them all ours. But first of all, Return. In other words, do an about face. You've been going this direction. Now it's time to return. Okay? Listen, America is in this place where they need to do this. Okay? Because if we don't do this, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. God, God has given us too much for God not to judge us when, when he's judged all the other societies in the world. Okay? We're not, to, we're not above God's judgment. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not just speaking that, but hey, listen. I know Jesus took the judgment for each individual on the cross, but he didn't necessarily take the judgment for nations. Okay? We are going to be judged for the way we act and the things that we do. We're spilling filth throughout the world. There's no boundaries anymore. There's no boundaries in television. There's no boundaries in anything. Do you think we're going to get by not being judged by God? We need to do this about face and return, return, to return. Start looking in his direction. Then he says, Samuel says, remove all the bales and the asherahs. In other words, it's not enough to turn around because a lot of people do this. They go to Billy Graham, and, yeah, I repent, oh yeah, I want to live forever. But they never begin to live for God. They never start removing everything that stands between them and God. God wants all that stuff out of the way because he doesn't want us to live in pride every time that one of these idols are in the way. Guess what? It stands between us and God. So get rid of the pornography. Get rid of the, the things that are bringing you down. Get rid of those things that are hurting your faith, the lying, the cheating, the stealing, the, all these things. Get rid of these things because they don't belong between you and God. Then he says, Rekindle. It's not enough to return. It's not enough just to remove. Now I have to ask God to stir my heart again. You know, if I have a love for the word of God, do I have a love for prayer? Do I have a love to spend time with God? If not, then Lord, help me rekindle this. Let the fire burn in my heart again. Let me get in char on fire for you again. Let me start stirring those things that you get stirred about. Let me get a love for lost souls, God. Let me give these, get, get these things back again because I don't have it anymore. Rekindle the fire, Lord. Start stoking the fire with more wood, fresh wood. You know, if you want to have a love for the Word, you've got to spend a little time in the Word. The more you spend time in the Word, it starts getting rekindled again. Wow, I'm excited. You know what God showed me today? You know what God showed me today? You know, I've got these messages prepared for the youth at camp, but there's probably nothing more important than what he showed me this morning. He says, you need to teach these kids to love my Word. So I'm just going to, because I know a lot of them aren't going to bring their Bibles, because a lot of it at camp is... And we're spending time with our friends. 
So I put my nice PowerPoint up there. We read it, all this stuff. It's nothing in place of the Bible. Okay, but what I'm going to have to do is print out sheets. And I'm going to tell them, I want you to spend some time with God. And what does God tell you through these verses? Because I could preach good messages all week long. And they say, oh, yeah, Pastor Andy. Oh, yeah, that was good. But I don't, if, I, if they don't get in their word, it's all going to fall away within a week or two. Okay? They need to rekindle. They need to rekindle. They need to rekindle. How many of us need rekindling? By the way, it's a chapter, it's just in the beginning of chapter 7. The last one I put is just renew. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Once you rekindle, once you return, once you remove, he begins to renew everything that was lost in your life. Some of us have lost peace. Some of us have lost the ability to forgive. Some of us have lost the ability to stay strong. Some of us have lost that passion to be mighty in spirit. And we need to rekindle, remove, Restore everything that God wants in our lives. Just so you know, I'm not speaking to anybody specifically here. I'm just speaking what God gave me, okay? For all of us, including Pastor Andy. I don't sit above you. I sit humbly down here like this. God, rekindle my passion for you. Rekindle my ability to give back to you.